Okay, so hi everyone. My name is Lydia Webster. I am the assistant curator at the Center for the Arts and Religion uh, here at the GTU, the Graduate Theological Union. Uh, and I am so delighted to invite all or welcome you all today to our celebration um, of the recent release of Dr. Catherine Barouche's new book, Imaging Pilgrimage, Art as Embodied Experience. Uh, and before we get started, uh, and I pass over to Dr. Bruch, I just quickly want to let you know, because I do see some new faces, uh, a little bit more about what CARE does uh, and how you can get involved with us more. So there are two of us here um, on staff at CARE, myself and Dr. Elizabeth Pena, uh, who, along with serving as the interim dean of the GTU, is um, CARE director. And at CARE, we offer courses and workshops in the arts and religion, uh, art exhibitions, which for the moment are all online, um, events such as these, also all online for now, and also grants for GTU faculty and students uh, for arts and religion projects. Um, and I'll drop the information uh, to learn more about CARE in the chat box in a minute. Um, so I'll just thank you all again for joining us and uh, hand it over to Kate. Thank you so much. Hi, hi everyone. I see so many um, familiar faces. I'm so glad that you all came to this. It's, um, it's just really nice to be able to have a little toast uh, in this time of pandemic. And I'm really grateful to the fine folks at CARE, Lydia, and um, Elizabeth for making this possible. Um, and of course, the book uh, is about pilgrimage, but it at times uh, felt like one. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and I'm going to tell you a little bit about the book and then we'll have some time uh, for Q&A and I could see a whole bunch of the artists who are featured in the book here with us. So hopefully they'll be able to chime in and maybe say something about their process of art making as pilgrimage. So let me go ahead and share. Okay, can everyone see that? Great, so I'll just talk for maybe a half an hour and then we'll, um, and then we'll do some Q and A. Um, so the writing of this book coincided with the birth and first four years of a uh, second child, my son, Jack, and the pandemic, which meant lots of distractions when the kids were sheltering in place with us at home and a number of personal losses, including uh, my grandmother, who I wrote a little bit about in chapter two. And you can see here uh, Jack's progression from when I was using him as a coffee holder <laughs> during the writing process as a newborn to now, and it doesn't seem to have uh, affected him too much. I remarked recently to a student that my field work has become more fun ever since it started to take place in actual fields. Um, and the research for this book, the research for the book muddied my boots and filled my senses. I wanna take a moment for a few thank yous and I'll read an abbreviated uh, version of the intro um, after that. So my biggest debt of gratitude is to the artists and pilgrims who so graciously participated in the many interviews that comprise the bulk of the research. I was welcomed into homes, studios, backyards, religious communities, local pubs and cafes, and in one case, a restored vintage Gifford Circus Caravan in U University Parks, Oxford on the right. Um, thank you to Sri Bhaktima, Guy Hayward, William Parsons, Kitty Rice, India Windsor Clive, Gisela and Swaste, Tom Nan, James Kay, Sam Lee, Alan Franks, Kiara Ambrosio, Annie O'Neill, and curator Jen Steger. I don't know if she's here, but it's her birthday today, so I also want to say happy birthday to Jen. For the trust you have placed in me and allowing me to tell these stories, which are your stories. And I also just want to take a moment to acknowledge Phil Volker, whose backyard Camino is featured in chapter one. Phil died two Sundays ago after living with stage four cancer for a decade, all the while welcoming pilgrims, sharing meals and tapas with them, and offering all of himself into healing conversations and friendship. So um, thank you, Phil. Let's take a moment to acknowledge him. The book would not have been possible without funding from the Thomas E. Bertelson Jr. Endowed Chair, the support of the Center for the Arts, Religion, and Education, and the George Greenia Fellowship for Pilgrimage Studies. A few other words of thanks to the wonderful community of scholars that comprise the Jesuit School of Theology and Graduate Theological Union. I am forever indebted to the feedback I received at every stage of the process and for being able to bounce ideas off of my friends. 
I appreciate the hard work of the staff of JST and GTU who helped with a lot of um, behind the scenes aspects of the book, including photographing images. The library staff of the GTU provided much needed resources um, and scans and worked double time over the pandemic, making sure that scholarly resources were available to all of us here. I'm also grateful to the editorial team at Bloomsbury and my family for their patience and to two student research associates who helped with a lot of the behind the scenes work, um, Emily Potthest and Mary Riley, who's gonna be joining us a little bit later. And finally, I'm really grateful to everyone who held my kids while I was doing field research. Here's a photo of Rena Frankiel, who not only held the kids, but actually conducted some interviews for the project at one point when there was an important pilgrimage happening in the UK and I couldn't get back there. Um, and so I'll go ahead now and just share a little bit of the intro. The problem is, is that we won't be able to get into depth, but it'll give you kind of a sampler of the project and hopefully you can um, pick up a copy from your library and, um, and read some of these stories uh, in their depth. This book traverses a circuitous path of winding forests in the Pacific Northwest, its beginning and end demarcated with a post covered in feathers, finger worn rosaries and prayer cards. It contemplates a jar of water collected from Banos de Agua Santa in Ecuador and placed on the dashboard of a former prisoner transport bus. It sings out famous and forgotten songs unearthed from the archives and rewilded into the landscape where they were composed. It pauses to dwell on a spindly olive tree at the center point of a labyrinth in California, a souvenir statue from Holy Grotto enshrined in a cigar box covered in sheet music and lace that smells of oil and incense. It lifts up these and other humble symbols, the people who brought them forth and engaged them and the intersection of the time, timeless moment that they engender. Edith Turner, the humanistic anthropologist and scholar of ritual and religion, once wrote that the heart of pilgrimage is the folk, the ordinary people who choose a materialist expression for their religion. In other words, pilgrimage as a religious act is a kinetic ritual replete with actual objects, sacra, and is often held to have material results such as healing. This book tells the stories of these people, the pilgrimages they have undertaken, and the artworks and environments that they have created, which are linked to their journeys and continue to act as vibrant places of encounter and embodied experience. Recent scholarship in the field of medieval studies has established the importance of manuscripts, maps, and labyrinths as sites of mental or stationary pilgrimage for those who could not travel for a variety of reasons. One such example is the story of the Dominican friar Felix Fabry, who is known for recording his own pilgrimage in various awesome. formats. So here toward the article. If you identify, someone might need to mute. Sorry for that. Um, and uh, and then, sorry, Fabry was approached in the 1490s by cloistered nuns who desired a devotional exercise so they too could, could, could receive the spiritual benefits of pilgrimage without having to break their promise of a life that was sheltered from the outside world. Fabry produced Design Pilger, a pilgrimage by proxy in the form of a day to day guidebook to Santiago de Compostela, Jerusalem, and Rome. Fabry's guidebook sent the pilgrim on an imaginative journey of a thousand miles without having to take a single step. So another example of objects that enact an experience of sacred travel might be the practice of sewing um, these little pilgrimage souvenirs in the form of thin lead badges into illuminated manuscripts, which Megan Foster Campbell has described as an aid for personal devotion beyond the temporal physical experience of a pilgrimage journey, facilitated mental or virtual pilgrimage for the book owner through memory or imagination. This is in line with the work of scholars who have shown through a historical lens, the integral relationship between place, proximity, sight, and touch, which is tied to attitudes toward relics of the saints, but also intrinsic to the spread of pilgrimage and to the power associated with primary holy spaces and the secondary network of sites, which develop through the belief in transferable holiness. Then as in now, tracing a map with a finger negotiating the circuitous path of a painted labyrinth with the eye or walking a backyard Camino are actual pilgrimages in and of themselves rather than pale substitutes for the real thing. So imaging pilgrimage shifts the focus from the Middle Ages to the present in order to examine critically contemporary art that is created after a pilgrimage and intended to act as a catalyst for an embodied experience for others. It follows some of the recent scholarship on pilgrimage authorship and narrative, but with a particular attention to how stories emerge and how they are experienced through the extra textual. There is a continuity of the idea of transferable holiness, 
and the afterlife of religious relics and objects with which beholders and artists engage as part of art praxis today. Which is presented here through a close examination of a number of specific and thematically interrelated case studies. The rapidly expanding field of studies in the visual and material culture of religion has brought forth new and powerful, a new and powerful awareness within the discipline of art history of the ways in which both viewers and academics can engage with devotional objects. This is a thriving area of inquiry that has seen the development of a number of centers, initiatives, and publications, including our own Berkeley Art and Interfaith Pilgrimage Initiative, um, which is in the uh, nascent phases, but hopefully we will be able to make an announcement about that very soon. <clears throat> Pilgrimage Studies is another emergent area of inquiry from which scholars like Simon Coleman and John Ede have been instrumental in re-examining the critical lexicon of pilgrimage and also considering virtual landscapes such as Walsingham in England. So this book tries to bring these various fields into conversation by offering a number of lenses and theoretical approaches, materialist, kinesthetic, haptic, synesthetic, through which to engage objects that become sites activated through religious ritual praxis and negotiated not just with the eyes, but with a whole multiplicity of, sen um, of the senses. So each chapter focuses on a contemporary artwork that links one landscape to another, from the Spanish Camino to Phil's backyard in the, in the Pacific Northwest, from Lourdes to South Africa, from Jerusalem to England, and from Ecuador to California. The places and projects are diverse and include vernacular devotional artworks and also institutional commissions from artists and creators operating from both within and outside the art world. Some of the artworks were created by Catholics as part of their ongoing spiritual formation. In these cases, the objects are brought into dialogue with notions of pilgrimage that are rooted in scripture and compatible with church teachings. Many of the artists, however, incorporate a diversity of religious beliefs and ritual into their iconography and praxis. From aspects of Catholic popular piety to bhakti theology, to the honor given to the apus, the protective spirits of the Andes. The close attention to context and experience also allows for popular practices like the making of contact relics, also called third-class relics, to augment conversations about the authenticity or perceived power of a replica or a copy. It also challenges the tendency to think of the original in hierarchic terms. Artwork that engages two or more traditions demand a dialogical approach to comparative religion. In such cases, my focus re remains on the interrelated or syncretic aspects of these systems of belief and religious practices as they relate to the material culture of pilgrimage in particular. At the core of the study is the claim that objects collected from and inspired by pilgrimages contain history and memory and act as sites of trans-temporal communitas. Throughout this book, Communitas through culture is posited as expanding beyond the group of pilgrims as it has usually been applied in anthropology and is used to think about the complex reception of an object, what Victor and Edith Turner called a symbol vehicle, such as a visual representation or a song, as a site of community in and of itself, where through the act of viewing or touch, the beholder connects to those who have encountered the object in the past and those who will again in the future. The Turners employed the term communitas to encapsulate the idea of anti-structure or the removal from the everyday in order to describe spontaneous encounters with others and the possibility of renewal and transformation that occurs on a pilgrimage. It differs from secular art viewing through its st status as a place of quote, ritualized reenactment of correspondences between a religious paradigm and shared human experiences. The idea of communitas is experienced by a group has had continued currency and scholarship, particularly anthropology, and has been applied within a diversity of contexts, but usually in service of a discussion of group dynamics. So things that people have considered to look at um, communitas recently have been rituals, rock concerts, and even political rallies. It has also been criticized due to competing ritual practices, unstable relations among groups of pilgrims, and opposition and conflict between contingents at sites. In this study, I'm not so interested in any of that. I'm not interested in the communitas potentially formed between the pilgrim and the group of people with whom they are traveling. And I don't make any claims for any kind of uh, homogeneity among those groups. 
Rather, the focus is on the import of the shrines, sites, and landscapes, objects, and songs that spur a sense of community between the pilgrim and with those who have encountered the thing in the past and those who might in the future. The idea of a feeling of connection with a community that is perceived but not physically present emerges again and again in the context of pilgrims' descriptions of encounters with landscapes, sites, objects, and in one instance, collective singing. Sometimes it is expressed in the language of a cloud of witnesses that includes the living, but not present, as well as the departed. Other pilgrims describe the sense of the tangible presence of ancestors, saints, or even God. The artworks that form the focal points of each chapter seek to reactualize the sacred journey, engendering this experience of communitas through culture for the beholder. Such an approach also allows for a constellation of elements and dynamic and flexible relations with each other, as proposed by Coleman and Elsner. Pilgrim, site, object, artwork, and audience. And I do go into some actor network theory in the book, but you'll have to read the book for that because I don't think I'm going to do it right now. Um, but to that end, an essential part of pilgrimage is bringing home a token of the place. Such objects serve and still serve both as proof that the pilgrim had visited the place and as a physical manifestation of the spirit, or as Coleman and Elsner have said, charisma of the sacred center. They say, quote, in this way, the sacred landscape becomes diffused permeating even the everyday lives of those who have never been to the site itself. Souvenirs can function as an aid toward reenacting the journey in the imagination for the pilgrim who has traveled to a particular site, but also as a link, an imaginative link with a sacred landscape or space for someone who hopes to encounter it in the future, hence taking on that sort of trans-temporal dimension. So I'll just walk through some of the case studies in the chapter in which some of these ideas are explored in greater depth. Um, so chapter one is the story of Phil Volker, who mapped the Camino de Santiago onto a plot of land on Vashon Island in the Pacific Northwest, following a diagnosis of stage four cancer. This backyard Camino, and later the documentary film based on the project, are examined as case studies through which to develop the notion of the perceived transfer of spirit from a sacred site to a representation while acknowledging the historical roots of virtual or translated pilgrimages within Catholic devotional practices and popular piety. As Volker emphasized, cancer, Catholicism, and Camino are our center around which we re revolve. One feeds into the other. For example, he always referred to the difficult and painful days post-chemo as his Pyrenees weekends referring to the physical, spiritual, and emotional hurdle that many pilgrims encounter as they negotiate the mountain range at the beginning of their journey, encountering dangerous terrain and unpredictable weather. I imagine that few pilgrims who have journeyed Ashon to walk with Phil Volker have shared all of their beliefs, nor is professing a specific faith necessary to gleaning the benefits of the backyard Camino or a film. However, the rootedness of the project within the realm of Catholic spirituality is what allows some of the points about the efficacy of objects as an adjunct to worship and the metaphor and meaning of pilgrimage in that tradition to emerge in this case. I argue that the backyard circuit is not a nostalgic recreation of a Camino in Spain, but is experienced by many on its own terms. The external walk has also been mapped onto an internal transformation, which in turn reflects the spirit in which it was created by Volker. Drawing on the work of Christopher Wood, who discusses the potential of medial shift from thing to thing, and Vivian Sobchak's work on film viewing as an embodied experience, I posit that there is a network of meaning connecting the Camino in Spain to the path that Volker forged in the backyard to the documentary film with mutual participation between media. Chapter two places the work of South African artist Sri Bhaktima, who creates shadow boxes of assemblages and souvenirs collected from Lourdes in dialogue with medieval and 19th century art, which is rooted in the same impulses of memory, imagination, and devotion. In addition to Marian imagery, Grobler also, Gro her name in religion is Sri Bhaktima, um, but she's also called Hetty and Grobler. Uh, she also draws from Bhakti theology. I contend that the shadow boxes function in much the same way as two scale or miniaturized reconstructions of myriad sacred sites the world over. Both the Lourdes Grotto, and as we will see towards the end of the chapter, the Govardhan Eco Village, also called GEV, 
located 108 kilometers north of Mumbai in the foothills of the Sahadari Mountains, where the entirety of the site is experienced as the new Vrindavan, with Arati and other devotions taking place there. These two examples, which relate to Sri Bhakti Ma's project, are among the many initiatives to build reconstructions of famous holy places that can be accessed by pilgrims who are far from the original site. There is an implicit ecological imperative embedded in Sri Bhakti Ma's art and these larger scale projects, which all work through what Colleen McDaniel might call a culturally constructed authenticity. The need to physically travel to a site is mitigated through being able, through being able to act, interact with the souvenirs, water and objects collected there. In this time of climate crisis, the possibility of objects that can engender an experience of pilgrimage remotely is a way to mitigate environmental impact and it remains a leitmotif throughout the whole book. Chapter three moves from the built environment to aural expression. I contend that music like objects can function as a site of communitas. My focus is on a collective of artists, musicians, writers and pilgrims who went on a pilgrimage um, based on William Blake's poem, Jerusalem and rescue and rewild the song. By doing so, they create an intentional temporal shift through the use of melody and lyrics, underscoring the continued importance of landscape and oral cultural expression. And this is not Blake's Jerusalem, but this is one of my favorite moments when doing field work. So I'll just give you a little um, musical interlude here. This was um, taken uh, spontaneously when we had, we had walked a very muddy pilgrimage um, partway along the Canterbury, the old Canterbury Way um, from Battle Abbey to Rye. And this is William Parsons and Guy Hayward, um, the co-founders of the British Pilgrimage Trust. And uh, when we, we were sheltering in a church and they lay down um, with their legs facing uh, west and east and sing this hymn to the Virgin Mary. I'll just play you a small bit. Als das Kindlein hoch den Band getragen, da haben die Dornen Rosen getragen. Jesus und Maria. Do you hear that okay? Sometimes it gets a little garbled. Um, so the, the chapter, this music chapter, chapter triangulates the ritual practice of singing and sound making, the importance of the embodied experience of moving through the British landscape in this process, and finally visual artwork that has emerged from these journeys, particularly drawings by Kitty Rice and India Windsor Clive that were created during and after the 2016 pilgrimage inspired by Blake's poem, And Did Those Feet in Ancient Time, now known as Jerusalem set to music by Sir Hubert Perry in the 20th century. Recent scholarship in the field of critical musicology has begun to take seriously the quote, ineffable dimension of music and its potential for transcendence and reenchantment. The chapter draws on art historical and anthropological approaches usually used to discuss objects as well as work on the, as well as work on the ineff ineffable in musicology in order to further explore the role of music in terms of translating pilgrimages of the past into the present. Chapter four turns to an installation piece on a former prisoner transport vehicle by visual artists Gisela and Swaste entitled Making Marks Again. The piece comprises sculptural elements as well as an altar sito, a little altar containing an assemblage of objects and souvenirs collected from pilgrimage sites. I argue that the bus installation generates a multivalent viewing experience. It's achieved by bringing this and other works by Insuaste into dialogue with American painter, assemblagist, and pioneer of happenings, Alan Capro's theory of reinventions. And like the other chapters in this book, examines Insuaste's praxis in light of an augmented understanding of the Ternarian notion of communitas. Widening the aperture, the chapter also asks whether artists, curators, and museum educators today can help audiences understand the performative, interactive and multi-sensorial multi dimensions of devotional practices past and present, and what it might mean for sacred objects to be recontextualized in a space like a prisoner transport bus converted into a roving art gallery. 
XBUS is representative of much of Nswaste's work and in that the installation comprises intentionally assembled objects found, collected, and created, each giving visibility to stories of trauma and healing, and especially her own family's experience of immigration uh, from Ecuador to the USA in the 1970s. Following Margaret Kovach's approach of holding up story as indigenous methodology, I aim to honor the interrelationship between narrative and research, allowing method and meaning to work in tandem to form a quote, culturally nuanced way of knowing through Inswaste's art making and my own embodied viewership. And the final chapter, this is a place that will be <laughs> familiar to many uh, of my colleagues from the Jesuit school who have joined us today, um, continues to build on the idea of the transfer of spirit from the sacred locus to a representation through a focused study of the outdoor labyrinth at the Jesuit Retreat Center of Los Altos, designed and installed by Tom Mann in 2014. There has been a recent proliferation of modern labyrinths embedded in pavement built of stone and sculpted into turf, often popularly imagined as scaled down pilgrimages to Jerusalem. I don't make that argument, but I do lift up the fact that it's become kind of embedded in the popular imagination, or even as some have said through the cosmos. Labyrinths have begun to be installed in environments like public parks and hospitals. I saw my friend uh, Maggie Preston join. She made a, a really wonderful chalk labyrinth on the street um, outside her house in Berkeley at the beginning of the pandemic. A lot of people, um, uh, took a lot of joy in um, and have become kind of part of meditative practices across the diversity of religious traditions. The Los Altos Labyrinth is considered within the context of Ignatian spirituality, drawing on the experiences of pilgrims, retreatants, and Nan himself, all of whom described a sense of divine presence while walking the circuitous path. Ignatian spirituality, which involves being in harmony with creation, and an emphasis on the active presence of the divine among people and things offers a particular lens through which to examine an, an embodied anagogic experience that is facilitated through an aid to imagination, in this case, a built environment. Given the compatibility of these tenets with that of several contemplative traditions, labyrinths can be posited as a nexus for a dialogical approach to comparative religion. And finally, the concluding section looks at London-based artist Chiara Ambrosio's series of handheld zines called As Far As the Eye Can Travel. Ambrosio engages visual tactility as a conduit towards an embodied experience in the zine subscription series. The title of the series invokes the medieval idea of contemplative, a contemplative pilgrimage of the eye through manuscripts and the ancient theory of vision called extra mission in which the eyes are believed to emit rays that apprehend the particularities of objects, hence linking sight to touch. The objects are interactive and cinematic. On one page, a panoramic landscape, the next an intimate portrait. The aperture of Ambrosio's lens widens and narrows, carrying the viewer as far as the eye can travel from Coney Island to Palermo and beyond. Her project is both an archive of landscape and spaces and an invitation to a voyage, an extra textual way to talk about transcendent, I'm quoting Chiara here, to talk about transcendence, to translate the mystifying and often unspeakable revelations that occur in those fleeting moments of deep connection with a place, a person, or an object. What holds on to you and hurdles you towards a much wider history than your own singular one, end of quote. Her words encapsulate much of what is explored through the book, the sense of a tangible presence of the past, the representations of space and place through extra temporal communitas. So I am just getting to the end here, but I'll say that the finished manuscript for the book was submitted before the global pandemic of COVID-19 struck. Pilgrims have faced travel delays and cancellations for centuries, including plague and, and, and ill health. Um, then, as now, one strategy has been to bring pilgrimage into the home or into the religious community. The pandemic has inspired myriad opportunities for pilgrimage in place. These include social media pages, my favorite one, which is on um, Facebook and actually called Pilgrimage in Place. I see a couple of the, um, the people that are part of that group here today, where participants walk a number of miles a day, sometimes mapping their journey onto an established pilgrimage route by tracking their progress on a map and develop a real sense of community through um, Saturday Pilgrim Tables organized by Annie O'Neill, who's also the director and producer of the film, Phil's Camino. 
The opportunities for sacred travel examined in detail as case studies throughout imaging pilgrimage are open and accessible to pilgrims of varying abilities and limited mobility, including quarantine. They beget an experience of long distance travel without the physical exertion of continual daily walking or the massive environmental impact of air travel in this moment of climate crisis. Volker's Camino could be negotiated with a riding lawnmower, as you see Sister Joyce doing here, and other projects engage the senses, sight, touch, smell, and sound in varying capacities to usher the pilgrim into the space of a faraway landscape. The concluding section distills several of the themes that emerged throughout my research, including scientific advances that have begun to quantifiably measure the ancient wisdom of the healing benefits of activities such as walking, viewing sacred artworks, and chanting. The process of bringing this book into fruition also revealed a fascinating web of interrelated projects in the contemporary art world across traditions and cultures, as the people I interviewed me uh, pointed me towards many others creating work in a similar vein. And I'll just say that um, on the Camino de Santiago, the term trail magic is often used among pilgrims to describe fortuitous encounters or remarkable coincidences or faded encounters, depending on one stance. And I just wanna say that a lot of trail magic happened during the process of writing and researching the book. And I'll just, I'll limit myself to just one little story. Um, I was assigned a really great editor through Bloomsbury named Sue, and Sue is from Great Britain. And she would send me the chapter page proofs along with notes about how she was looking forward to traveling to Ecuador or to California vicariously through reading the book. Um, and while editing chapter two, she shared that she had actually been um, on a choir trip to Montserrat and had a little pin dish uh, with a black Madonna on it on her writing desk while she was doing the editing of the book. And while editing chapter uh, four on Gisela and Celeste's work, she was randomly sitting across from someone from Ecuador in a shared office space to a devotion to Our Lady of Baños and was able to ask questions about the geography of the place in Ecuador that I was writing about. And when she finally got to chapter five about the Los Altos Labyrinth, she shared that her sister-in-law lives there in Los Altos, even though Sue is British. And her last name is Pham, which is the surname of um, my friend and colleague, Hung Pham, who I saw joining the meeting with whom I had traveled with to uh, Montserrat. And the very last thing I'll share is that when I was working on Exbus, Cizela and Suaste's project, um, and when I got to the little altarcito, I picked up one of the jars of holy water, which was from Montserrat. And it was just a few weeks before I was about to embark on this trip. So it felt like kind of a prophetic um, moment finding that jar of water from Montserrat to a place that I, um, you know, right before I was going to travel there. So I will stop the share now so we can all see each other. Hi, everyone. And I think we could probably unpin me. Oh, someone did great. And I just wanted to invite um, some of the artists that I see here. I see Gisela, I see um, Will Parsons, Kiara. I don't know if someone wants to jump in and maybe share a little bit about your art making process as a pilgrimage or your experience um, collaborating on this project. Well, well, please, yes. Hi, Kate. Can you hear me all right? Hey, well, this is William Parsons of Wayfaring Britain, and I'll drop the um, I'll drop the link to a site in the chat. Well, first of all, Kate, congratulations! Unbelievable download of pure information. Thank you very much. I can't wait to read the book. Very excited, and thank you for all of your dedication to uh, to create such a piece. Thank you very much. Very exciting. Um, and it's a real honor that you featured some of the singing pilgrimage work of, of the British Pilgrimage Trust, which I co-founded and no longer exactly work with, but that's a story we won't get into. I just wanted to quickly talk about song as part of pilgrimage. Is that okay? Great. Um, can you hear me all right? Great. Um, you mentioned so many fascinating objects and, and you talked so beautifully about how pilgrims would make the journey on foot or, or on horseback or however to 
to receive these objects, whether it's dust or shells or water or, 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 or artwork or come what may. And I just wanted to bring in one other, one other part of the story, which is um, the reciprocity aspect of gift giving, um, because medieval pilgrims would also carry a often a sculpted piece of uh, beeswax, a candle, which they would give as a gift of light to the shrine. It was the sort of payment that they would give in order to receive the blessing of whatever physical object that was. And that reciprocity is something one doesn't often see in the in the modern revival of pilgrimage. And it's something I'm, I'm all for um, promoting, actually. Um, so in terms of song, which is uh, my the chapter that you you I contributed to to some degree song goes perfectly two ways and it's the most wonderful gift to carry and because it weighs nothing uh, it costs nothing the more you give it away the more you own it forever it's um it's a wonderful pilgrim gift I recommend it strongly and it works in these two ways it works as a as a gift to carry to offer to all of the shrines and holy places all along the way whether they're you know natural or 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 human made i mean for example that that song that you played earlier singing maria durch and dornwald's king maria mary it's, it's a perfect pilgrim song mary walks through the, the thorn woods and she's got jesus under her heart and when she walks through the thorn woods which haven't uh, blossomed for seven years they will blossom uh, because she's walking through with holiness and it's a wonderful analogy for the, the pilgrim walking with holiness actually changing nature you know it's, it's a hope for our times i would say in, in this climate um moment of kairos we we face obviously pilgrimage journeying on foot specifically is the great future of ecological travel it, it's you know we all of our machines we're going to have to put them away at some point and just you know go back to what we've got but um song works perfectly for that as a because that song maria Duch, on walking from winchester to to canterbury on this um money-free pilgrimage for the sort of third time I've done that route but this song in all the Marian centers along the way um just you can you can sing it and you leave a trail of, of the echo of of this this resonance that a, a sort of song line that builds up and builds up and then we finally reached Canterbury Cathedral people know about Thomas Beckett obviously and um uh, Anselm Alfage but the oldest part of the Canterbury Cathedral is actually the St Mary Undercroft in the in the crypt it's the dark deep place of going inward and they stopped the whole choir practice and all the thing just to let us sing this this little song at the end of our journey and it sort of carried the whole journey previous the three weeks and all of those those strange adventures with it just this moment of gift and there's a sense that it echoes forever that gift of song but not only the gift the blessing can also be the song what you're receiving so I've, I've made these pilgrimages where actually the purpose, the blessing one was seeking was to find a song in itself. Um, for example, um, walking from the Roman fort of Carnarvon to the Druidic holy mountain of Holyhead um, and the, during the Brexit vote, because obviously that was where the Romans, the, the Europeans, doofed the British spiritual tradition, the Druids, and massacred and burnt the groves and... And then, you know, 1700 years later, we have this, this vote and this increasing tension between Europe and, and the UK again. And the, the purpose of that pilgrimage was to try and discern a melody for the oldest British lullaby um, called Pies de Nogad in Old Welsh. And, you know, sleeping in the bat on the battle sites and in the burial mounds and just trying to, trying to make the destination a melody. It's a song it works both ways. We found the melody, a melody, I mean, not the melody, and within a month managed to sing it to the, the Prince of Wales, Charles, at, at some strange lunch. That, you know. So uh, <laughs> whether that proves a concept, I don't know, but uh, um, can, I, can I really just sing you that right now? Just as, as my last little, can I offer you that? Yeah, go ahead. Well, it's very short. Okay, apologies to everyone if you don't speak old Welsh. Um, it's basically by baby bunting, but the origin, and it goes, Pies de nogad for ice for ice, so grew in balawad ban the ice. Wheat, 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 oh guys, go han on, go hen in with guys. Pan elide da di helia, 
Chlathar o usgwith, chlori yn eich llaw. Ef gelwi gwn go gahwg, gif gaf, dali, dali, dwg, dwg. And, and goes on. But that's what I'd just like to leave you with, the idea of the song as an object that can be not only something that you discern from your pilgrimage, that you pick up in the wind and take away and keep as a treasure forever, but also something that you can give as a gift along the way and as your payment in kind, perhaps. Um, and that's, that's, that's me out. And Kate, well done. And thank you so much for, for your wonderful work. Thank you all. Thank you for the gift of that song. Um, I was wondering if Gisela, oh, Kiara wants to jump in. Go ahead. I just wanted yeah, to, yeah. It Hi, just, Kira, welcome. Sorry, just um, to follow what Will was saying. So first of all, huge congratulations from me too, and thank you for including me. It's such an honor to be uh, part of this journey, actually. But what um, Will just said made me think, I'm, I'm from the south of Italy, and my father lives in one of the Vesuvian towns on top of the volcano. And every year, there is a very ancient um, ritual where um, people, walk up the mountain and um, play music <laughs> and song and uh, drumming mainly for the mm. whole day and dance in to give thanks to the volcano for not having erupted and then that is followed by what you said almost like the gift of light you know instead of a beeswax uh, candle they do these extraordinary fireworks so it's called the the, um, the festival of fire so the whole mountain um, catches fire essentially. So they shoot these extraordinary fireworks coordinated at the same time. And just what, what's really extraordinary for me is that it's this, this offering, but it's also leaving with um, this extraordinary gift of life for another year or uh, however long it lasts. And what you said made me think of I, I only read the introduction, Kate, and, and, and the section, you know, where, where you leave uh, talking about my zines and so far. And I was very struck by this idea about, the, it's something that I'm, I'm primarily a filmmaker and um, within my film work, I'm very taken by this idea of what is the destination, where is the destination? Is it the departure or the arrival really? And to me, they, they keep, more and more becoming one and the same according to the work I've done so far and I love this idea that um, in seeking for a destination you are uh, also setting already setting off on a new departure and um, making these zines that you know you talk about I realized that um, as a photographer I've always been um, taking through through my eyes as a form of offering, offering sort of um, um, a reciprocation through seeing people into existence, or seeing small things into existence, um, giving space and, and voice and, and airtime or, you know, a platform to things that often go unnoticed. But then one thing that really did strike me, was particularly when making this one, which you talk about in your last chapter, was the fact that um, I, I was compelled, once I've made this, for the first time as a visual artist, I was compelled to take it back to its place of origin. Um, it's not something that I'm accustomed to doing. Um, it's the first time I did it. And um, when I took it back, as you write in the, yeah, that's, that's the image, we placed them, um, you know, Justo, Jorge, who you see in this image, had died, but his wife took the little booklet that I had made and put it in exactly the same spot where Jorge was sat in this picture. And then and there, I realized what the essence of, of um, my work was. And since that point, I have made a real um, issue for myself of taking the work back. So when I work with documentary film, I've, I've been taking the work back to its place of origin. And a lot of what you talk about, the magic on the Camino, Camino magic, the, the, this, this incredible um, alchemy occurs, this transformation of the point of origin into the point of destination that becomes, again, a point of origin for a whole other set of questions um, became very clear. So I think I, I just wanted to add that, that in a way, it's, um, it's just incredible to think about 
um, the possibility of not just um, taking or giving, but actually making something physical just as a gesture towards um, rippling, you know, towards pushing stories out again, somehow, like uh, the building of rats somehow, you know, and through your embodied experience of a journey, you can create and, and we enchant um, many, um, many environments and experiences that are very, um, that, that can't speak very well by themselves because they, you know, because often they can't because they don't have the um, the time or resources to. So I guess our our role in doing that is something that really strikes me hearing you speak as well. Thank you so much. I can't wait to read the rest. Thank you, Kiara. Um, have you have you and Will met before? No. Okay. Next time we're next time in the UK, we're all going to go on a walk together. Um, and I just didn't want to lose this comment in the chat from my colleague Eduardo Fernandez, who says um, that this conversation is reminding him of indigenous communities in Mexico who give their dance as a gift to Our Lady of Guadalupe. So there's another um, connection there. Hi, Kate. I wanted to, um, one is like, I, I also feel very honored to be part of this project and to have uh, spoken to you in depth about a lot of things that I, you know, making, making those connections. Sometimes I feel like within my practice, um, you know, how, what we're experiencing and what is being perceived and how it's, it's being interpreted, like, um, you know, it's good to put some distance to it. Cause I think sometimes like, it's like this, con con you know, um, it's, how we make and create, or at least for myself, like it takes time, like it, there's a process there. And I, I, you know, I feel like I've been experiencing that during the pandemic, what I'm seeing and then what my actions end up being immediately or like a year and a half later. But I wanted you know, something that um, um, about music and sound and thinking of, you know, in, in this one particular, um, uh, just certain kinds of projects where I, I put, or what, you know, we talked about cumbia. Cumbia is this, this music in Latin America, specifically like from, from Colombia, but my, my dad is a musician. And so how music has always been part of my, my growing up and, and my association with, with Ecuador and with my family in Ecuador and, and certain rituals and traditions revolve around that. So, um, and having been in Ecuador recently, like, a reminder of um, uh, how comforting it can be, but also how, but also very triggering in certain instances, right? Both like it can make you feel many different feelings and um, and come into terms with that. And um, but this idea of uh, sort of the maybe it's like the audio scape, right? As 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 in, in my practice, as I'm walking in the street or as I'm like sitting in a space and getting up and looking around, I think becomes important. Um, one of the, uh, there's, there's a project that I did in New York um, where I, I walked along 14th Street um, and acknowledging these spaces, these very um, personal spaces of my parents' immigrant history in New York. And, you know, the vacuum cleaner supply, uh, you know, factory that he'd worked in, my parents, where I was baptized, which is the Virgen de Guadalupe at that time, um, this small church that was where, like, the Spanish-speaking community really, like, took hold, um, uh, and then, and then the, the place where the church moved down the street, and, and, I, and along these places, I actually left these offerings, these, these ofrendas, right, and tie them to these locations as, you know, this sort of personal journey, and, and, and it was interesting as people, this is New York, you know, it was on a weekend, people walking around and I'm, and I'm like pushing and pulling this, this kind of mountain like structure that I'd created. Um, it's like, and then I would rebuild at each, at each point and tie these mementos and these. Um, so, so it was just thinking about like what we left, what we leave behind and, and, and it's, and what we let go of, you know, and I feel like that was this process of, 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 
acknowledging this this history and Maud Tyron's immigrant history is part of a larger <laughs> immigration history, but how, um, yeah, how how impactful it was for me, and, and I think also the people around me, like, not, you know, and it, it was, I, yeah, I think it was just, it was kind of interesting just how, um, going back to, I think, to, um, to uh, Kiara, it's like, going back to these locations and sort of reading something, um, maybe, you know, and acknowledging those, those spaces. Um, there was there was a comment. I think it was um, Eduardo, right? Like, um, haven't you know? I, I also did the Inca Trail many years ago, but um, whenever I would visit, you know, this sort of offering that you give the mountains, the Apu, you know, for me that was, and that's with just you know either a a, a, a like a, just a prayer of just being just asking the mountain for me like the mountains are these presents they they provide they provide protection and and um and in uh, andean mythology it's more of like how do we um acknowledge that the nature and the spaces around us and and an offer or um you know i always see myself as this insignificant person and like we're, we're traveling through this space that where anything could happen and, and, and acknowledging that these spaces have these spirits and these, this energy. So um, yeah, before traveling, it's just doing a, a small prayer. Actually, I, I tend to do this little cross and, or it, at that time when I did the Inca Trail was, you know, using ink, the coca leaves, right? As a way of acknowledging um, what was in that space and and where I was going to, so a lot of what everyone's saying, I feel like there's it resonates with some of my work and um, throughout throughout my the past like 10, 15 years. Um, so I, I'm again an honor to be part of this <laughs> this project and um, learning from everyone about your work. Thank you. It was an honor to be able to include everyone's work. Um, and I think the, the people who are tuning in can get a sense of the incredible richness of all of these projects. And, you know, it's like, what can you do in 250 pages or whatever? There, there's reams of um, information that I've collected from all of you guys. And it's just, um, it was, um, it was great to be able to kind of like, just distill it and kind of draw out some of these um, connections a little bit. And I'm also thinking of, um, Phil is not here, um, of course, but he, it reminds me of his project of um, giving, giving gifts as well. And the, the film Phil's Camino actually starts with um, Phil encountering someone on a road, he's walking down in Bashan Island and he's like racking his brain uh, for something that he can give to this guy because he likes giving gifts of himself, you know? And he, he just walks by and he says, hey, that's, if you go down in the woods, that's a good place for mushroom hunting. And the film kind of starts out with Phil giving someone advice about where to go uh, mushroom hunting. But later as he walks his uh, Camino through, through cancer and, um, and changes in his life, he starts to think about how even the act of acknowledging someone can be such a gift. So for him, it's just about acknowledging each other, um, which I think is a really beautiful way to think about some of these, these ideas that we're discussing today as well. You make me think of um, Peter Schumann and um, the bread that he gives to everyone who has the grace of sitting through one of his uh, shows. I mean, as a reminder that they need, they are active participants, sort of as a reminder that they need to chew and, and be active, but also just this nutrition, you know, this very simple gesture of, of celebrating your being physically in existence with him in this shared space. Um, Philip Schumann, uh, Peter Schumann, sorry, and the Bread and Puppet Theatre, for those of you who don't know him, I was introduced to them by, by Kate, in fact, <laughs> uh, but they are incredible, and um, yeah, that's just such a powerful thing. Yeah, I wonder if maybe just to conclude um, our session today, Kira, because I love that point, maybe we could just read out the Cheap Art uh, Manifesto. <laughs> Shall we do that to close? Um, because I think it encapsulates much of what we've been um, talking about, and it's also uh, right in the book. So let me find it. So this is the um, this is in Gisela's chapter, chapter four, and it's the Cheap Art Manifesto from Bread and Puppet Theater. And I'll just read this to conclude our our session today. And 
Um, and I want to thank everyone for taking taking the time to be here to to toast the book project and and celebrate these the wonderful work that's that's within the Why Cheap Art Manifesto. People have been thinking too long that art is a privilege of the museums and the rich. Art is not business. It does not belong to banks and fa fancy investors. Art is food. You can't eat it, but it feeds you. Art has to be cheap and available to everybody. It needs to be everywhere because it is the inside of the world. Art soothes pain. Art wakes up sleepers. Art fights against war and stupidity. Art sings hallelujah. Art is for kitchens. Art is like good bread. Art is like green trees. Art is like white clouds and blue sky. Art is cheap. Hurrah. Okay, so I just want to thank everyone and wish you all a Buen Camino and um, best wishes for the weekend ahead. And thanks again to Elizabeth and Lydia of CARE for organizing this event. Thanks, thank everyone. you, Kate. Thank you so much, Kate, and thank you everyone for joining us.